Hello, story seekers. I'm Ben. I'm Nico, and welcome to the Tiny Bookcases Novella Writing Month mini series. February is the shortest month, so we decided to write something longer than usual in it. We're also, quite crucially, writing the novella together. A first, as we've not written something substantial with each other before. Last week, you heard the prologue of the novella, and then we discussed our first impressions of co writing and how that went. This week, we're here to read another excerpt, this time from chapter one, and discuss our approach to working on the middle of the book. Let's jump straight in. Nico, hit it. Chapter one, Augury, in which we see the end of it. Sundered stone, unwelcome daylight. An axe shared is half an axe. Forge fire. Sweat bled into the coating of dust on the craggy faces of the two dwarves. Glint, deep in thought, furrowed his wide brow, breaking up the dark, tacky pattern. He fought the urge to wipe his face as one grey bead broke clear of the grime to drip from his broad nose. It splashed on the smooth orb of stony held, but they both remained quiet. Rumble flexed his fingers and ran his tongue over his cracked lips as he stared at the geode. The long dormant forge they'd found in him was silent and the thirsty darkness at the limits of his sight seemed to pulse with menace. They were far from their home. Rumble had felt that distance keenly since entering the abandoned mountain. The magnitude of the question that hung over them would soon be answered and they could get on with their lives. Magnitude was a word that neither wanted to consider right then. The small mountain they were in had collapsed so long ago that no living dwarf could have recalled its forge lit. The dead air and dust were proof of that as far as Rumble cared to consider it. Another dead mine inside another collapsed mountain. Glint had insisted that this particular mine had once been renowned for its wealth of geodes. Rumble had agreed, following his twin into danger to settle the matter between them. Glint had privately noted the frantically dug shafts they'd passed on their journey. Only a few had survived the collapse, but they told him that the thane of the place had not given up hope of finding more until it was too late. He wondered how many dwarves had died in the crushing dark here. Would they add to the tally? The tension unwound in an instant, as the silence became too much for Rumble. Well, this is it then. Rumble, unable to stop himself, puffed out his thick cheeks and let his breath whistle out. Aye. Glint looked away from the perfect orb of stone he cupped in one hand, and locked eyes with his twin. The warmth in their gaze could have lit a forge, and was a balm to Rumble's frayed nerves. Glint's other hand gripped the haft of their father's axe so tightly that his knuckles stood out as pallid peaks amidst the grimy flesh. With the silence broken, Glint went on. This is truly it. We leave here a king and his twin. Rich veins and glittering stones to you, sweet Rumble. Glint knew in his bones that it was of no difference which of them would be king when the geode was cracked. Whichever ruled, the other would advise. As it was now, so it would forever be. Yet, he realised that he was hoping the title would go to his brother. Rumble had his doubts. Kingship, he reckoned, was more suited to Glint's nature. He knew his brother was kind, fair, and capable of bravery beyond reason. He also knew what he truly was. The lesser twin. Pulled at once from their mother by the wombsmith, they were equal in all ways. Or so they were told. 
One must have been ahead, even by a strike spark's lifespan. One must have been the stronger, the wiser, the fairer. That one must have been Glint. He grimaced as the thought needled him, and comforted himself that soon the waiting would be over. Stone never lies. Once cracked, the gem within the geode would anoint Glint as king of their hold. Glint spanned their father's axe with a practice flourish, so that the cutting edge pointed up, and hovered the broad butt of the axe head over the stone egg. One tap, one solid tap, and it would all be done. He sucked a lungful of the dead air through his teeth, then did what they had come all that way to do. He pulled the axe up with imperceptible speed and brought it down hard on the geode. Crack! The sundered stone gave a wail, as though the long dead mountain were releasing its death rattle. The shadows around them shifted and plunged them into darkness so absolute that even their sharp eyes could barely see for a moment. When it cleared, it had leached the colour from their faces and drained the rock walls of their richness. It's dead. What? The quartz. There's no colour, no augury. Glint proffered the split stone. Confusion writ large on his dirty face. Rumble took it and saw that where there should have been a glittering interior, there was only shadow-stained translucent rock. Rumble dropped the split halves of the geode and tilted his head back. Glint saw the veins stand out on his brother's face and neck as he bared his teeth. Rumble's fingers worked the empty air before clenching into large fists. Don't! hissed Glint. Rumble roared out his frustration. The shout reverberated around the abandoned mine's forge, rattling the discarded chains once used to work the derelict bellows. Glint wanted for a moment, why he wasn't angry. His confusion deepened when a new sound rattled the mountain. Boom. The huge noise surprised them both, a resonating reply to Rumble's shout. It was so loud that their ears could not comprehend it, but rather their stomach shuddered with the thunderous noise. For a moment, it was as though all of the inner workings might burst from the pressure of it. Light, blinding after the darkness, snapped on after another resonating crash, filling the ancient space around them as a rain of stone began. Huge shards of schist were falling, crashing about them and shaking the ground. One falling slab, larger than the rest, hurtled towards them. Glint was the first to act as, with a bark of exertion, he threw their axe at it. Eyes filled with rock dust, Rumble watched the weapon soar. The axe flew true, connecting with the side of the slab and redirecting it. It missed him by a beard hair's breadth, instead crushing the old dormant forge's heart. He dashed forward and deftly caught the shared axe as it fell. The deafening booms of the rockfall faded and were replaced with the grinding noise of something large scrabbling at the stone of the mountainside. Glint squinted up at the gaping hole above them. He was transfixed for a moment by the strange blue light of the outside world seeping into this forgotten corner of the hollow mountain. Then the bright light illuminated what had broken the mountain wall. It was, in many ways, an arm, but wrought too huge. The flesh of it was gnarled like the bark of an ancient tree, and its humongous fingers groped down towards them in the forge. Rumble's mind reeled from the scale of it. If its arm is so huge, how terrible must the rest of the thing be? That one clawed hand would squeeze the jelly from them if it found them. Instinct and fury prompted him to swing their axe. He hacked at the muscle-knotted wrist and felt the impact as the axe's bite forced the gnarled flesh to give. 
The hand shuddered, and a strange, keening howl assaulted their ears. The howl was like that of an animal, but was complicated by nuance, as though a thousand guttural voices were joined together in a chorus of agony. He struck again, and again, at the same spot with savage precision, until the appendage was severed. The enormous hand crashed down beside them amidst the rubble, where it squirmed and thrashed with huge, twisting movements. The howl reached a high-pitched crescendo as what remained of the arm whooshed past them as it was rapidly withdrawn. Fear replaced shock in the bellies of both dwarves. Grandfather's braided bullheads! Rumble swore, and Glint tore his eyes from the hole. When the howl cut off, the enormous hand began to shake violently. The rope-like tendons within it snapped taut as it convulsed. A stink of marshland guff and the musk of dried blood filled the destroyed forge, like smoke billowing from an overfilled furnace. Glint watched with wide eyes as the huge finger muscles began to shudder and bulge. What the fuck? The hand exploded. Huge globules of flesh and bone splattered across the forge in a dozen distinct chunks. Foul-tasting blood splashed against Glint's teeth. As he spat it out, he saw the piles of viscera twitching as they reformed and rose into horrendous creatures of wiry muscle. A dozen figures, each perhaps twice the height of a dwarf, were born from where they had landed. The dull grey of their knobbly skin matched that of the enormous arm Rumble had hacked them from and they were covered in the wet sheen of their transformation. Fresh, cruel eyes rolled forward in their skulls to stare hungrily at the world they found themselves in. Without hesitation, they echoed the howl of their birth and scrambled forward on long, curving feet towards the two dwarves. Rolls, grunted Glint. Rumble tightened his grip on their ancestral weapon and met the gurgling shrieks of their enemy with a war cry of his own. Glint's voice joined in with his brother's bellow, and together their sound resolved into a long and low note. It was the first beat of their battle song. It called for carnage. There we go. So what's that? That's like the first thousand or so words of the of chapter one? It is. It's uh, when you're enjoying it, like I think we have really started to. Yeah. You know, we, we came in saying things like, oh, yeah, and each chapter will be 1,500 words or whatever. Mm. But then you start to find story and they're just not. I think we're dangerous when we're not sticking really firmly to a word count. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I mean, that one was actually 1,500 almost on the dot. I just checked it for, uh, just for accuracy. And yeah. yeah, there's there's still uh, still what another thousand or so twelve hundred words left of that chapter. Um, but yeah, we, I think there there is a degree of that. But at the same time, when you when we're when we're finding new ground, when we're writing together to like create a longer story, I think it's fine. Like wherever yeah. we want to, what you know, whatever we think people will find interesting, and also enjoy writing should be what we're doing. Um, it's very odd to start on a big... Like, it doesn't quite start on a big fight, but it, it basically starts on a big fight, doesn't it? Um, it's, a, it's it's doing stretches before it kicks off. Yeah, there's, 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 some, there's some stuff with the geode, which is some nice world building and stuff, but we, we, we sort of see them start to take shape, I think, the twins. Yeah. And then, obviously, I think people can guess what the next 1,200 words of this first chapter is, which is <laughs> a huge fight with 12 trolls. I have a um, they have big picnic with sausage rolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think um, so. We're, we're this is the this is the episode that we've entitled the middle, and it's because we we are in the process of writing the middle at this point. So this is the yeah. first time that I've looked at chapter one in about a week now. Yeah, it's with a bit of space from it. There was stuff in there that I'd forgotten, which yes, was same. exciting on that. You know, going through it now together. 
Yeah. It, it was very fun to go, oh, yeah, that was that's a fun thing. And I think what's really interesting about it is there are chunks where I'm like, I don't remember who's that Who is. That? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So this was, um, I mean, but maybe we should talk about the the way that it was read this time, because in in the first episode, of, well, the first excerpt that we read from this novella, I did the narration and he did the voices. And then we, we flipped it for this one. What did you What did you make of it? How did you find that? I thought it was really fun. Uh, just for uh, for the, for the listeners, so you all know, we didn't sort of record all of one and then do the other. So we've both got a copy to read from, and I was uh, I would stop, and Ben would put the voices in, and it really did make the characters feel alive for me because I wasn't in control of their voices. It was, it was, was very a... similar to how we've done the the radio plays in in the past when we've done yeah. the the Die Hard Christmas special and the um, the Yuletide Carol. That's that that was how we did it, and uh, I enjoyed it then and I enjoyed it now. It's it's a lot of fun. I, it, I think we've not yeah. quite decided how we're ultimately going to do it um, for the audiobook, but it's it's coming. There's conversations being had, which feel a little bit premature because we haven't finished the fucking thing yet, but we're on the way. It's uh I, I am I would say genuinely pleased with the shape of that first half of that chapter. Like in the grand scheme of the thing, that's you know, it's not anywhere near to, I wouldn't say not anywhere near done, but it's not anywhere near the the polished story that I would love to put in the hands of our lovelies. But, yeah, so I mean full full light behind the curtain moment. That is that is a sixth draft. Yeah. at the moment um and i think there's still some work to be done there there's almost when you go to read it out properly in this way rather than sort of mumbling it to yourself like a crazy person um <laughs> you, you yeah, um you st- yourself, thank you sorry rumbling it to yourself yeah um <laughs> you sort of see where the flow needs to change a little bit and i think there were a couple of sections in there that i, I just thought oh i'd love to just get my editing pen out but there's like there's that bit of your brain that editing scratches um which was was being set up a couple of times but i wouldn't say anything too bad i think maybe there's just a bit of massaging to be done um but yeah i really I like it, it was, i thought I, I, for myself at least it was in in sort of crashing against this chapter together and then ultimately as we've done started to sort of spread our roots out throughout the story i think mm-hmm. writing this one helped me say okay we've we have the tone we know the characters a bit now we know what the world tastes like smells like a little bit so now mm. i feel like i can go and write like i did you know some of chapter eight and you can go and do three and then six and then 11 and yeah and it feels like because we have that the kind of the scaffold there of knowing what it should be a bit like you can just do what you need to do to get words out of yourself and then we can make it all you know, we can sand it down to the right shape at the end. It's. I think that's. I think that's a great nice. point. I that like to for like full clarity on that one. Like, I think we this this chapter took the longest to write of what we've done so far because we both wanted to work on it until it, we felt like we'd built the tone. So this was almost like the palette that we built up the color of the the book on was this chapter, yeah. um, and then as you've said, we've we've taken a more structured approach to sort of spreading our roots out through the rest of it, which was quite interesting because I, I would classify myself and I would definitely classify you as a pantser. Yeah. Um, you know, writers that can just go and uh, just they find out on the way, um, typically a little bit more editing on the back end because it's it can <laughs> be a circular the way. <laughs> Yeah, because they found out on the way and it's obvious that they did. Um, but uh, this time we were struggling a little bit to like, have the agency to go and write sections of this book. Um, at least I was. I think we had a couple of conversations where you expressed the same. So we became a little bit like plotters, didn't we? We we got a we got a spreadsheet out and we put out how many chapters we thought we wanted, and then we started putting the important plot points for each of those chapters. But every step of the way that we did that, we were saying to ourselves, if we start writing this bit and it's not, it, it isn't that. We can just change it. What we're not we're not married yeah. to this 
to these plot points in this order, but it just gave us something to kick about. And I would say that first structure was pretty weak. Like it wasn't doing much uh, at all. Um, but it was so crucial to getting us to the point where we could actually work. Um, and as soon as we did that, we were both off and just going and doing bits of our own things and then coming back like excited dogs to show to show each other like sections <laughs> yeah, of the uh yeah it was it was really exciting it, it like i think we found another gear in this project this week um which has been really uh, enjoyable for me a big part that i've i've picked up from you especially is that knowing that you don't have like if you go and write part now of chapter two or whatever you yep. don't have to finish chapter two you don't have to no you don't have to stick on that chapter till it's done. If you write 150 words and you go, ah, do you know what? I, I can't find this quite yet. You can just write a different bit. Yeah. There are there are no rules. I'm learning there are no rules. It's fantastic. <laughs> that's really positive. I think the other thing that's been quite freeing for me um, is that we, so we've not really, co as we said in, in the intro, we haven't really co-written anything on this scale before. Um, we also don't typically share our first drafts of anything with each other yeah. because we we write for the podcast and then we read out a, an edited version for the podcast. And that's the first time when, you know, when Nico reads me a story on here, it's the first time I'm hearing that story, like 99% yeah. of the time. So that was quite odd in a way. There was, the, there was a certain like vulnerability to it because f first drafts can be a, a real mess. Like they can be you know, where you've edited on the fly two sentences together, but you haven't changed the clause structure and it just, yeah. it reads like you've been hit, you've been kicked in the head by a horse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least mine does sometimes. And um, I actually quite liked that in the end. I, I had to get over it a little bit. Uh, but after I did, it was a bit like, oh yeah, that, this is just a first draft. You know, this is something that yeah. we've said repeatedly on this podcast and guests have said repeatedly, but it's so hard to hold in your mind when you're first approaching writing a book because you want it to be good. You want it to be the best thing yeah. you've ever written. But asking that of the first thing that comes out of your pen is is a ridiculous thing to do to yourself and to the thing that you're trying to create. So yeah. I think this co-writing process has been quite, there's been a certain amount of ego death. Like it, it, you know, it's not possible for it to be good the first time somebody sees it because the first time your co-author is going to see it it's going to look like you wrote it in crayon. I think the uh, a big part of what's made the, you know, that opening up, having that vulnerability is that it, it helps you to really focus in on what your strengths are. Like uh, we, we have discovered that I can quite aggressively fire loads of ideas at a page and then look back at it and be like, I think that that's something. And Ben is very good at then coming in and saying, I get what you're saying and helping me to, you know, through a, a pass and then moving some things around and putting in some of Ben's voice, we'll, you know, the chapters will evolve and we find, you know, ideas that I might not have known how to utilize, Ben can pull out and vice versa. It's really cool to have mm. someone you can trust and someone you're, you're sort of in simpatico with be able to say, I, oh, I get you in a way that means I get what you're trying to say here. And that's made it, you know, finding that speed has made this, it's gone from something we're trying to do that felt like it was against the clock and trying to, to beat to something I'm just enjoying doing. Yeah. With a I friend. Think that's the thing. Do you know what I mean? It's great. The, yeah, absolutely. And uh, like the important bit there as well, because um, that, that's all lovely and I, I totally agree. It feels a bit like um, I'm like Hawkeye reaching back into my quiver and you're just putting interesting <laughs> idea arrows in my quiver. And I'm like, oh, that one. Yeah, that'll do there. And then I'm firing it at a target. But yeah, now the important thing to note there as well is that I think that idea of being against the clock in that NaNoWriMo style uh, was not working for either of us when we were co-authoring. We can both go away and do NaNoWriMo. We've done it a couple of times now where we just write yeah. a couple of thousand words a day, every day for a month. We can do that. But we found that that hasn't worked with the co-authoring. We have to be more inside each other's lives, more communicative about what we're doing, more structured in our approach. Um, and that that's changed. Our, that's changed. It. it slowed us down a little bit. I think we've probably got about a third of the word count done now. 
and we're yeah. theoretically halfway point. So we're, you know, if this was Nanarino, we'd be kicking ourselves. We'd be like, oh god, I'm gonna have to make it all up at the weekend. Um, but crucially, it's not. Uh, we are building something that we're intending to do right and do well. So we are going to continue the work on it. I'm I'm anticipating that by the end of the month we will have most of the most of the novella. I agree. Um, but I think there'll be rounds of edits and a little bit more adding to the word count, and uh, and then of course the the ultimate thing, which is to make the book, and we're self-publishing it for free, of course, and then we're going to do the audio book as well, which is going to be really fun to do. Um, I think that I think it's a fucking great project. I'm really excited about it. So yeah, I, I have to sort of occasionally stop myself from thinking too far ahead and starting to think about. What's the next thing we're going to write together? I don't know yeah. if you've had that yet. Um, whether it's more inside this world or whether it's other things. I think I've I've been quite lucky in that I can use my creative overspill because it started to make me want to make art linked to this project. But that's yeah. also a problem because do I do I write? Or do, do I spend six hours doing a big drawing that we might not be able to use for anything? It's going to make but, me really happy if we end up with an absolutely banging cover that you loved working on, though. Yeah. Like, if that's if if that's something else that can come out of this, I think that would be really cool. Because, we you know, we, we both are appreciators of cover art. Um, yes. We like the, you know, the old, uh, the old Pratchett covers and the fancy covers from the 90s and even some of the new ones, you know, like I like uh, the Abercrombie ones that have blood splattered all over them for obvious fucking reasons. Um, but there is this trend towards minimalism, isn't there? Which yeah, there is. we would both like to not do. Um, to shake a bit. So, yeah, yeah shake, shake the tree a little bit. Uh, so we'll see how it comes out. So as, as people listening can probably tell, we're, we're both excited about this project in a way that we maybe didn't anticipate we were going to be in the first episode yeah. we've encountered we've already encountered and overcome obstacles that we didn't anticipate um we've changed our writing style and structure in order to work together and that has that took a bit of doing initially and then has now like feels like it's flowing it's it's really gelled yeah. and it's coming it's you know it's coming i'm i'm very pleased with it where it's at right now All right with that said, we do have some words to get down. We'll see you all next week for a bit of a chat about writing the ending. In the meantime, if you want a bit more Tiny Bookcase, we are now available on YouTube. So if you look up The Tiny Bookcase or at The Tiny Bookcase on YouTube, all of our previous episodes are there. So drop us a subscribe and put us on in the background. We know how YouTube works. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For rich ginger tones on their scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for general fabulousness, why not the Ula La How's Your Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? <laughs> How do you come up with that shit, man?